Can you describe your experience in Vietnam with one word? Health. Can you describe the war in one word? Hell's the only word I can use. Like they say, with life is like a deck of cards. You, you don't know what cards you're going to be dealt, but you you learn to to play the cards you're given. My fellow Americans, not long ago I received a letter from a woman in the Midwest. She wrote, "Dear Mr. President, in my humble way I am writing to you about the crisis in Vietnam." I have a son who is now in Vietnam. My husband served in World War II. Our country was at war. But now, this time, it's just something that I don't understand. Why? I was born in Greeley, Colorado. Uh, Greeley was probably one of the best places for a kid to grow up at the time. Uh, we could get on our bikes and be gone all day and uh, go where we wanted, do what we wanted. Uh, our parents really didn't worry about us. Uh, they knew we were with our friends. Uh, and we pretty much had the, the run of the town. Greeley was an uh, agricultural community, uh, kind of the center of Well County, a big sugar beet uh, area. It's a lot like happy days is kind of what I grew up in. It, it really was happy days. So uh, it was a, probably about 30,000 people in the town at that time in northern Colorado, about halfway between Denver and Cheyenne. Uh, my father was a shoe repairman. He had a shoe repair shop there. In fact, my first job was shining shoes. As Lorne was turning into a young man, he used his religion as a platform to develop his core values. Uh, my folks were Lutheran, and so I was a Lutheran. We attended the Lutheran church, but I became very involved in, in the, what at the time we called Luther League. It was basically for junior high and high school kids to have a place to get together. And yeah, we went through uh, classes where we learned about communion and all that, but it was also a very social uh, organization as well. In fact, uh, I went to a, a convention in Detroit when I was like, 15 years old, which at the time, you know, I'd never really been anywhere or seen anything or been to any big cities like Chicago and Detroit. So I got to see them and uh, travel a little bit. The other thing that I got involved in when I was 14, I had an uncle that was a Mason and he got me to join D. Malay. And I really, really enjoyed it. I got so much out of it. It really had a lot to do with the man I am today. Uh, I learned the core values and I, I like to think that I still live by those values that I learned in Demolay at a very impressionable age, you know, 14, 15 years old. Uh, there's a lot of influence on your life, good and bad. And for me, Demolay was a very good and very positive influence on my life. So I, I learned to work with others, play with others, have fun, and, uh, and get to travel around a little bit. Uh, like I say, being from such a small town, uh, in a lot of ways, yeah, without, looking back at it now, we were probably hicks, but we didn't know it. We enjoyed it. We had fun. Uh, when I, in Colorado, when you turned 14, you could uh, have a, a motorcycle license. Well, so my dad bought me a motorcycle, and I had another buddy that had a motorcycle, and him and I were two of the few guys, so him and I became buddies. In fact, he's one of the guys I joined the Army with uh, later on, so... Uh, it, uh, and I'm still friends with him. Uh, several, most of my classmates, I just got back from my 50th high school reunion last year. And uh, we're still, we stay in touch on Facebook. Uh, there's, there's people scattered all over the world. We have friends living in Europe and Africa. I have a, a friend with the Peace Corps in Africa right now. And uh, it's just amazing that these, these friendships, and uh, as you, you go through life, Friendships are so important, 
And uh, I like to think that I, I still have some of those friendships from when I was a kid. Lauren always had the thought of joining the military in the back of his head, considering all of his friends' parents and his parents played a part in World War II. Being a, uh, all of our parents had been in World War II. You know, all of our parents had served in the military. And so, yes, it was always, and we grew up playing army. You know, it just was part of the fabric of our lives is uh, that we knew our parents had been in the military and, and we accepted that. And we uh, were very accepting of the idea of us going into the military. When I was in junior high school one time, I had to write a, a lesson on what I was gonna do when I grew up. And I put in there that I was gonna be a, a jet engine mechanic in the Air Force. And I mean, that couldn't be any further from the truth of what really happened to me in my life. But at the time, uh, yes, uh, I had an uncle that was in the Air Force. And uh, so military uh, was always fresh in, in our minds. and. We accepted it as, as part of our lives. I always say the worst thing I ever did to my mom was go, joining the army, but the best thing I ever did was coming home from Vietnam. So uh, they, you know, back in the 60s, we had the draft. And so it, it really didn't have a whole lot of choice about it. No, they, they didn't want me to go in the military. And my, my dad even tried to talk me out of it, but really with the draft, I, I didn't really have much of a choice. And so uh, they, they pretty much had to accept that uh, I was gonna end up in the, in the military. Lauren knew that going into the military could become a reality later in his life, especially with the current situation within the U.S. government. Back when, when John F. Kennedy was, was inaugurated, one of his famous sayings was, Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. When JFK was elected, he had a charisma that had never been seen before in office. President Kennedy was ready to take hold of the greatest country on earth and eradicate the growth of communism. JFK was a firm believer in the domino theory, so he truly believed if one country fell to communism, the surrounding countries would too. His plan was to help finance an increase in the size of the South Vietnamese army and to send military advisors into Vietnam to ensure everything was running smoothly. Lorne found out about the War of Vietnam through his family. His brother already established his roots in Vietnam through the Army. My older brother, uh, he went into the Army, and uh, he uh, ended up going to Vietnam. He was with engineers and uh, went over and helped uh, build some of the uh, runways and uh, some, of, some of the first infrastructure uh, in Vietnam uh, to allow for all the troops that were to come behind them. With the increase in U.S. units, there has been a step up in the number and scope of activities performed by U.S. forces. Just as everything was getting started. The president's car is now turning onto Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. I was on Stemmons Freeway. November 22nd, 1963. Waiting their chance to see the president as he made his John Fitzgerald Kennedy was shot and killed at the age of 46. This sent shockwaves through the country. Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in at 2.38 p.m., just over two hours after JFK was assassinated. LBJ had similar beliefs to President Kennedy. He went on to amplify America's involvement with the Vietnam crisis. The number of U.S. troops in Vietnam soared from 16,000 when he first took office to more than 500,000 in 1968, yet the conflict remained unsettled. Lorne was put into a situation where he had to make a tough choice for the first time in his life. I volunteered for the draft. I, two of my high school buddies had, uh, their, their draft numbers had already come up and so they, the two of them were going. And they said that if I wanted to go with them, that I should go down to the draft board and tell them that uh, I, I wanted to. Nearly two-thirds of the soldiers in Vietnam were volunteered. Like Lauren, many volunteered because it was very difficult for young men in their late teens and early 20s to find a job during the draft. As war dragged on, 
anti-war demonstrations were tearing America apart. Anti-war demonstrators protest U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War in mass marches, rallies, and demonstrations. Central Park is the starting point for the parade to the U.N. building. The estimated 125,000 Manhattan marchers include students, housewives, beatnik poets, doctors, businessmen, teachers, priests, and nuns. Makeup and costumes were bizarre. Before the parade, mass draft card burning was urged. Demonstrators claimed 200 cards were burned, but no accurate count could be determined. Reporters and onlookers were jostled away on purpose. Although mostly peaceful, shouted confrontations were frequent and fiery during the course of the march. The anti-war marchers were picketed by anti-anti-war marchers who were hawkish toward the parading doves. This country really was split in two uh, over the war. Uh, there were the, the, the hawks and the doves, and the hawks were uh, all for the war. They, boy, we've got to stop communism in its tracks, and if we don't stop it there, it'll spread throughout the world. And, uh, and then there were the doves that were saying, no, that, that's not going to happen. The, Vietnam is a one tiny little country. No matter what opinion Lauren had, he had to put everything behind him and head off to basic training. It was quite an experience. Uh, it, uh, a big, big change uh, where your life is regulated from the time you wake up in the morning till the time you go to sleep at night. Basic training was meant to expose the new soldiers to light infantry weapons. Most of the time, soldiers were required to know how to disassemble, clean, reassemble their rifle, and how to shoot in any circumstance. The soldiers needed to be transformed from the average civilian to a fit, well-trained warrior. The whole process was very organized and all of their days were scheduled down to the minute. It was kind of funny, I weighed 145 pounds when I went in, I weighed 145 pounds when I came out, but it was a different 145 pound body than uh, when I went in. There was a psychological lesson to be learned as well. The training was meant to teach the young men how to work as a unit and how to get prepared mentally for the war. The process was very efficient. After being transformed at basic, Lauren went on to go to advanced infantry training and in NCO school. After uh, basic training, I uh, went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for uh, advanced infantry training. And uh, from there I went home for 30 days and then I was sent down to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia for uh, NCO school. The Army's need for highly trained small unit leaders has long been answered by Fort Benning's superb officer candidate school. The candidates move through a rigorous 23-week course, striving for the gold bars of a second lieutenant. Each man becomes proficient in the operation and maintenance of all infantry weapons. whatever reason uh, that didn't work out, which was fine with me. I really didn't want to go over to Vietnam as a NCO. Their life spans was about as short as a second lieutenant's in Vietnam. After all of the training back in the States, Lauren then boarded a flight that would change his perception of everything. So in December of 1967, uh, I went to uh, California and uh, we were put on commercial airplanes and flown to Vietnam. Uh, when I got to Vietnam, I thought I was going to the, the 25th Division, and because of all the casualties the 9th Division had su been suffering, uh, they sent us down to, uh, to Bearcat for our in-country training. Uh, that's the first thing that happened when uh, you go to Vietnam is you have to have in-country training. In-country training was meant to correct the mistakes the soldiers made back in the United States. That was not the only purpose, however. The conditions in Vietnam were addressed as well. The humidity affected electronics, the heat was unbearable, and the rain made every situation uncomfortable. The environment caused everything to be more dangerous. 
Not long after Lauren arrived in Vietnam, he figured out what his role would be in the war. I was assigned to a, a mortar platoon uh, when we were in Dong Tam, but uh, we were actually part of the Mobile Riverine Force. That was a joint operation between the Army and the Navy. It was called the Mobile Riverine Force. The 2nd Brigade of the 9th Division was its primary combat unit. One must go back to the American Civil War to find a major precedent for this Inland Waterways Task Force. Army and Navy working together as a fighting team. When the men go out on a mission, they have the close support of the Navy flotilla with all the facilities necessary to resupply and maintain them. For about half of the year that I was in Vietnam, we lived off of a uh, troop ship, a World War II troop ship, like they used to take the troops into the Pacific and into Europe. Uh, that was our base of operations. We uh, had bunks on there. Lauren was a rifleman while in the Mobile Riverine Force. Being a rifleman was a very complicated task while being in Vietnam. We were all riflemen. Uh, we all carried as much ammo as we could carry. Uh, we had machine guns, and each of us would wear one or two uh, bandoliers of machine gun ammo in addition to our own ammo, hand grenades, uh, rocket launchers. Lauren very rarely saw the enemy, but he always carried his rifle and extra ammunition. Uh, we did a lot of looking for them, and usually when we found them, it was because they let us fight them. They wanted to engage us. And uh, New Year's Eve of uh, 1967 was my first overnight operation. Now they dropped us off uh, out in the jungle and uh, they put me out on an LZ, which is a listening zone or a listening post. The whole idea is, is if the enemy does try to do a sneak attack or whatever, they'll come upon the LZ first. So I spent that night out there uh, with bugs and crawling on us. Went to get back on the tangle boats to, to go back, and that's when the enemy, who had been there all along, decided to open fire on us. Uh, and that's much of the way it, it went in Vietnam. The enemy pretty much chose the battles. Lauren was transported to his operations and sweep-throughs on a unique kind of boat. Tangle boats. And uh, the tangle boats you can think of when the front end drops down on them, that's what they would take us out. All they have is a canvas top on them. In fact, that's what they're referred to as a canvas top uh, tango boat. Tango boats were identified by their extra armor and their rather large ramps that were used to deploy soldiers. These machines could be beached in the narrowest canals to allow the units to start their sweep throughs or patrols. Tango boats were also covered with canvas to minimize weight, but later versions were equipped with a flight deck that could handle a helicopter as big as a Huey. In case of enemy attack, the boats were also equipped with machine gun turrets. And uh, so they would take us up and down the canals of uh, South Vietnam, drop us off, and we would make sweeps through the rice paddies and the jungles. Most of the time we were out in the rice paddies, scouting for the enemy, and learning how to operate in the deceptive terrain. What looks like a scenic rice paddy to the eye often feels like a swamp to the feet. You're lucky to keep moving, however slowly, in this watery muck. When it becomes more muddy than watery, a man can be completely immobilized. Getting stuck in a mud hole can be an exasperating experience. The swampy mud makes one grateful to hit open water. This stream was supposed to be fordable. In a way, it was, from the neck up. Carrying all the extra equipment would start to wear on the men, making it grueling to get through the endless days, not to mention living through the rugged conditions that Vietnam had in store. We could only be out in the field for about three or four days at a time. Uh, most of us would develop what is referred to as immersion foot. When you're in water constantly, after a while, the skin starts, just from the rubbing of your boots, the skin comes off your feet. And so after about three or four days, they would take us back to the ship, 
and they would they had a barge tied up next to the ship. The first thing they would do was hose us down, get all the mud off of us, and uh, then they'd let us go onto their clean ship and get a hot shower, get a hot meal. Uh, we could watch a movie that night. We could write letters home, uh, and uh, so we would we would be on there at least uh, one night, and then. Uh, the next morning then, three, four o'clock the next morning, they would put us back on the tangle boats. We'd go back up and down the rivers so that by sunrise we'd be where we wanted, they wanted to drop us off. And we would again make our sweeps through the, the rice paddies and jungles, looking for Charlie and, and finding him when he wanted us to find him. As Lawrence's time in Vietnam went on, he would cross off the days on a short timer's calendar. We all, everybody had a short, it's called a short timer's calendar. And, and you mark off the days that you have left. And see, the, the thing that was so different about Vietnam than, than the, what it is now is we had a one year obligation of being in Vietnam. So what, exactly to the day, one year after you arrived in Vietnam, you went home. Lauren's experience in Vietnam was coming to an end. He was able to reflect on one of the very few positive things that came from his experience. Well, the friendships, the friendships, like I say, the friends that I still have, that, that's really the best. That, uh, there was really nothing else uh, good to remember, uh, but it's the people. It's the people that you learned you could count on, you could count on them to, uh, help you and you could help them in, in, in the most dire of situations. So yes, I, I had a short timer's calendar We every day. And even in the, the last 30 days, it's not 30 days, it's 29 days and a wake up. Because on that 30th day, you're gonna wake up, and you're going getting on that big bird and you're gonna fly home. In uh, December of 1968, uh, I had finished my year in Vietnam and they had come up with uh, what they called the five month early out. Uh, if you had five months or less left when you returned uh, to the United States, uh, they, they would discharge you right then and there. And rather than having you go home for 30 days and then trying to find some place and a job for you to do for four months or less, you know. Uh, so when I came back, I had slightly less than five months left and uh, so uh, I arrived at Fort Ord, California, and within 24 hours I was uh, discharged and put into a uh, Class A uniform and sent home. But, and, and we, as we referred to it, back to the world, because we didn't consider that really part of the world. Not our world, anyway. And that was the end of my military career after 19 months. Prepping for his return home, Lawrence sent out a letter that would symbolize how ready he was to return back to his friends and family. A passage from the letter read, Above all, keep in mind that beneath the tanned and rugged exterior, there is a heart of gold, the only thing of value he has left. Treat him with kindness, tolerance, and to an occasional fifth of good liquor, and you will be able to rehabilitate that which once was and now is the hollow shell of the happy-go-lucky guy you once knew and loved. Last, but by no means least, send no more mail to the APO, fill the refrigerator with beer, get the civvies out of mothballs, fill the car with gas, and get the women and children off the streets, because the kid is coming home. Getting back on American soil, uh, it was a big relief is probably the the best way I can describe it is the I had lived through my year in Vietnam, my 365 days. I had lived through it. I hadn't even been wounded. And so for me, that had been my goal was, was to survive Vietnam. And I did, and I accomplished my goal. I weighed probably less than 120 pounds when I came home. 
And so, yeah, the, I ate and, and drank and uh, was able to put some weight back on. Because uh, I, I was I was terribly skinny when I came home from Vietnam. And, but after a year of eating on sea rations, uh, it tends to do that to you. I don't know, if, I've thought about this quite a bit. You know, after World War II, World War I and World War II, it was referred to as shell shock. You know, they came home and they, they just weren't quite right or whatever. Oh, when we came home from Vietnam, uh, because of some suicides that went on, some shootings that went on, we were all kind of labeled as those crazy Vietnam veterans. You know, they, they went over there, they, they did, were involved in terrible things, they were in, involved in a terrible war, war in a terrible country. And so, you know, don't rock the boat with them and hopefully they'll, they'll settle back into civilian life. And uh, so that's what we attempted to do. But the, the ones that didn't, they're the ones that made the headlines. And they're the ones that kind of, we all kind of became classified as that, those crazy Vietnam veterans. And uh, uh, it, it it's, has been so interesting over the last 40 years to see how returning veterans have been treated so much differently after Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and that they've come up with this PTSD that is now an accepted condition. And, uh, but there, there, we didn't have a label like that when we came back. Uh, we were just, uh, they thought we were all crazy and had all been on marijuana and drugs and everything else. And uh, they just kind of put us all into one group that we all were the same and we weren't. We definitely weren't, but uh, we were all labeled as being the same. What I had and probably still have to some extent is survivor's guilt, uh, especially that uh, the first 10 years or so, uh, the survivor's guilt uh, was, was very hard to deal with. And uh, l luckily I, I met a, a woman who I uh, married and loved me and, and helped me get through that period of my life and readjusted. and. That, uh, but also, I, I guess I do have a, a type of PTSD. Uh, loud noises really bother me. I, uh, if there's a pop or a bang or something that I'm not expecting, I, I react more than anyone else in the room to it. Uh, and I, I was that way in Vietnam, and I, I've, I've been that way for over 40 years now. It's just part of the way I am. Uh, it, I know a lot of people on, you can watch a program on TV or whatever, and, or even with fireworks or whatever, and it doesn't bother them. But to me, it still does. It still does. After being on, on, in such a tense situation for a year, that's part of it I've just never really been able to, to get over and get rid of. I had uh, taken a job in Germany in, back in 89 and 90. Uh, we lived in Germany for a couple of years, and then we moved back to Colorado. I was in the hotel business, and uh, there was a recession going on, and I couldn't get a job in Colorado. So the Clock Tower Resort here was looking for a controller. That's what I was. I'm a hotel controller. Was a hotel controller for 35 years, and uh, they were looking for a controller. And so uh, I, we moved here in 1990, and I was uh, here until 1999 when the Atwood sold the Clock Tower. We moved back to Colorado. I was there at a hotel for a few years, and then uh, I was offered a position in California at a resort out there. So I was out there for almost five years, and then uh, when I retired, uh, we moved back here. Uh, this is where our daughter and our two, two of our grandchildren live. And so that's why we came back to Rockford, and that's why we live here now. But we still have a son in uh, Colorado, and that's our excuse once a year, is to go back and see him and our granddaughter that lives out there now. And, uh, but I'm, I'm always amazed at how many people just, they were born and raised here and lived their entire life here in Rockford. And uh, uh, I, I just think there's, there's so much to see around this country that I think it'll, even if you, if you want to spend the rest of your life here, that's fine, but at least get out and go see what the rest of the country is about. And if this is where you want to come back to, then, then at least you've seen the rest of the country. Um. In your opinion, do you think the United States ever could have won the Vietnam War? Yes. 
if we would have used all of our resources, we could have won the war. But it would have been a, a very high cost. It would have, millions of people would have died. And uh, so maybe in that regard, maybe it's, it's just as well that we didn't. Can you tell me about the first time that you met Lauren? Um, it was very brief. I met him at the Harlem Veteran Project football game. I was selling um, Chukka footballs. I was selling those. And someone, I think Stangy came up to me telling me that Lauren was present at the football game. He was part of the color guard. And I went out on the field. I shook his hand. And uh, he had to do his thing. I had to do mine. So we kind of parted ways until I met him at the Hometown Heroes event at the Midway Village. Um, being in the Harlem Veteran Project and sitting in on interviews and listening to my veteran stories, my friends' veteran stories, um, it's taught me to be very open because everyone has a different perspective. So I feel like this class has helped me take criticism a little bit better because I realize that not everyone has the same viewpoints as I do and don't have the same vision that I have. So I shouldn't have to explain it and it should be easier for me to um, convey my message. My biggest takeaway for this year, um, you know, I think it'd be the stay focused because I had trouble with that at some points and I had to keep my eye on the prize. Uh, it's something much bigger than a class, it really is. You're creating something for families to share and the veteran to be proud of and, you know, you're making a movie star. So I feel like the takeaway I got from the Harlem Veteran Project is to stay focused, know what you're working on and know the significance of what you're working on because it's something much more than what you think it is. My takeaway from Lauren and what he's done, it's incredible, he is a hero. Dear Lauren, over the past year, I've had the honor to preserve your story. No matter how many times I listen to your interview, I will never know exactly what you went through while in Vietnam. That is why I hope your documentary that I created is only as captivating as the great life you are living. You have taught me multiple lessons that simply cannot be learned from a textbook, and I will be forever grateful. Thank you for all the cooperation while helping me when I needed it. Thank you for sharing your story and letting the Harlem Veteran Project and I have the opportunity to document it. Thank you for teaching me that everything that happens is for a reason. And finally, thank you for your service, Lauren, and thank you for being a hero. Your story will forever be carried with me. Sincerely, Nick Talon and the Harlem Veteran Project.